Welcome back. A lot more topics to get into here. Let's start things off with NBA general managers potentially organizing, forming their own association. Keith Smith, you can find him on Twitter at Keith Smith NBA. Keith, what do you think this means for the NBA? The idea of general managers organizing and the story that it's in partially in response to what's going on with Neil O'Shea and the Portland Trailblazers. Yeah, I think so. There's a couple yeah. things here. The 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 this has been in, in the works, I guess is the best way to put that, uh, since March of, of 2021. So we're, we're talking eight months or so mm-hmm. already. Um, one of the things that they wanted to do was just basically, I want I'm stopping short of saying create a yeah. union because I don't know that that's right. what it is. But the players have one, the coaches have one, the the uh, NBA officials have one. Why wouldn't front office personnel have one as well? Um, because there's a couple things. One, it does give them a, a little bit of strength um, in in mm-hmm. certain situations if they feel like something is unfair. Now, the timing here feels a little weird uh, because you've got the Neil O'Shea yeah. uh, investigation going ongoing. That sounds like that's uh, getting close to wrapping up, and then we'll get the findings, and then ultimately if there's any kind of uh, punishment or loss of job for O'Shea, uh, we'll find out on that. But yeah, it's it's part of what they want to be able to do is provide um, advice and legal defense and all sorts of funds and those kind of things to to their fellow uh, partners. And one of the things that they said uh, in the article, which uh, Adrian Wojnarowski and Ramona Shelburne partnered up on for ESPN, is the idea is with Olshe is there's a thought process around, all right, well, if if them, who's next? And is this a way that ownership could start to look into how do we get out of contracts we don't like for general managers? Could we look for yeah. cause? Could we look to find something or something along those lines? And that becomes a whole whole uh, storyline that, that, you know, it, could it happen? Yeah, sure, it absolutely could happen. But I, I don't know that we, um, you know, know that that's the direction. I think that's my biggest concern from this story. As far as GMs organizing, Okay, like I understand the rationale behind doing that. I understand, look, players have it, coach, uh, you know, refs have it. I'll, okay, fine. If, if NBA general managers want to as well. But if the sense out there is that the motive for the Blazers doing what they're doing right now with O'Shea is because they are looking for a way out of paying him. They, they are, the thought was brought up that NBA attendance has not been what they hoped it would be this season and that the COVID losses are still kind of hanging over their head, and they might be looking for a way to get out of these payments. If that is the case, right? And I'm not saying it is, because to me that feels a bit far-fetched. But if that is indeed the case, this is very similar in, I guess it's a terrible word here, but grossness to if it turns out that Ben Simmons is using the mental health thing as an excuse to kind of put the screws to the 76ers. If that's what it is, that's a big step back for the mental health push. That's something that's bigger than Ben Simmons. And if what's going on here, if what's being brought up against O'Shea, if this is not real, if this is more just something that the Portland Trail Blazers, and again, I don't know if I believe this, but the Blazers are just creating in order to get out of paying him, that's that's a big step back for people who are legitimately in situations where their employer is acting inappropriately, right? So. I would hope yeah, that's not absolutely. the case here and what we're really talking about. Yeah, my, my hope is because this was in the works months yes. ago, this is not a snap reaction to we have to defend one of our own and all these things. I mean, we hear the same thing on the ownership side. Now, they, they don't have a union. I mean, their union is effectively the right. NBA uh, there. They, that's how they're in union together. But it is... We're on the ownership side, the things we hear is, well, we got to be careful with these investigations because I don't want to be next and who knows what they'll uncover next. So, yeah, I'm, uh, you're, you're hopeful that this is not a reaction to that. None of this is being used to to for reasons for any of this stuff. And and we'll see you know, where all of this uh, kind of goes uh, moving forward. But, yeah, it's uh, it's it's hopefully this is comes together for the right reasons and is used for that. Right that reasons. is a great way to sum it up. Uh, another interesting topic that come out, came out 
the buyout market, <laughs> we're, we're here already. <laughs> uh, John Wall, rumor coming out that the Heat are interested if John Wall is indeed bought out. Now, John Wall has said that he doesn't want to forfeit any, any of the money on his contract, which obviously would be necessary in a buyout situation. Yep. Um, the Heat being interested, to me, that's okay. That's fine. I mean, they've got a, a veteran point guard in Kyle Lowry. They don't have much of a backup, though. I could see why a team like the Heat, who fancies themselves as a championship contender, would say, yeah, we would love to bring in John Wall and make him kind of a combo with with Kyle Lowry and have one of them on the floor at all times and that sort of thing. So it makes sense in that, in that yep. sense for a landing spot. But I think the angle that I want to approach this at, Keith, is we talk all the time about looking at news and figuring out who benefits. So let's take that that angle here. Who benefits from this news coming out? What could the the motive be behind this? Yeah, I think probably Miami the most. And and to be fair, this story did come out of a my the the a Miami area newspaper uh, is where this story came out of. Um, so my guess is. One thing this is Miami kind of letting everybody know, hey, we're open to picking up yep. a point guard. Uh, their their primary backup point guard, I'm doing air <laughs> quotes around point guard, has been Tyler right. Hero, who's played amazing, but he's not really a point guard. He's a scoring guard off their bench. He, that, that's what he does best. He's not an offensive facilitator. When Kyle Lowry has been out of games, the vast majority of the minutes that he has sat, Jimmy Butler has played, and Jimmy Butler runs the offense, as he runs quite a bit of the offense anyway. Um, so my guess is they're looking for a way to, when Lowry sits a uh, not just in games, but sits for an entire game and those kind of things. Is there a way? Because right now it's Gabe Vincent, um, who's he's just he's an inexperienced younger player uh, who doesn't really have that. The, the only other guy that's that's point guard ish on the roster is Marcus Garrett, uh, who's probably more of a, a, a bigger guard and a wing than he is a point guard. So yeah, and then without any idea what you're gonna get out of Victor Oladipo and all that. It's more than enough to get by for Miami. But yeah, if you could strengthen your rotation with a guy like John Wall, sure. And this may be a way of kind of sending a signal of, hey, there's a home for you if you do want to give up 90, well, not give up 91 million, but somewhat walk away from a large chunk of 91 million because that's the only way the Rockets would do this. Uh, but let's go. But And then from the Rockets side on this, sure, if if. John Wall comes to them and says, I'll do what Blake Griffin did. Here's a bunch yeah. of money back in a bio, $20 million, kind of what Kemba Walker did this offseason with the Oklahoma City Thunder. Here's a ton of money back. Yo, go. I think the Rockets would say, yo, good luck to you. Yo, best of, you know, best for you in the future. But if if not, it serves the Rockets better to 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 keep John Wall into next offseason because then what the Rockets can do is now then he becomes an right. expiring contract. Expiring contracts always have value. So so then it changes the the math quite a bit there as far as uh, the value on the rocket side as far as looking for a trade. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see how they do wind up playing this, but I do agree. I think it's kind of a, a little you know sign to John Wall. Like, hey, if you do decide to give up money, we're right here waiting, man. So, Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, speaking of teams that have been connected to point guards, look at that segue there. The Mavs are, uh, are retiring... Dirk's number 41. No surprise that they're doing it. But now we have an official date. January 5th is when they'll be retiring Dirk's number. Much deserved. I imagine there will be some tears shed in the house when, when this happens. But um, very, very cool for, for an amazing, amazing player. Yeah, and played his entire career with yep. the Mavericks, Rare. which is you know something that, that we we've talked about in the past. Still means something if you know guys can do that. Uh, so yeah, really, really cool. You know, uh, beyond well, mm -hmm. well earned uh, honor for Dirk. Uh, jumping over to the Kings, Tristan Thompson. Did you see his his comments about the about the Kings? I did. He was yeah. he was delightfully candid with what he said about the Sacramento Kings. He talked about not needing any coach. To, to fire him up and that sort of thing. He also talked a bit about... <laughs> With far more colorful yes, language. Than yes, I am, I, am, I am very much uh, <laughs> censoring that, but... Keeping it exactly. family friendly here in case you got little ones in the car exactly. or whatever. We're, we're putting out the PG version here, but he also, I thought, <laughs> was very forthright in terms of his assessment of other franchises. He sounded like 
like one of us, like somebody who's analyzing the game and not a player with the way he described the other teams. You know, he he just went and said, like, we're playing teams that are not trying to win. Don't get me wrong. Their players are obviously are going to try to win. But as an organization, as a franchise, we face teams that were not trying to win in this four game stretch and we lost to them and, and how upset he was with that and everything. It was just a very honest assessment instead of kind of the, the typical answer that you would get out of a player. Yeah, I learned covering him last year for the first time on a day to day basis when he was with the Celtics that, yeah, if he's got something to say, he's going to say it. And he doesn't mince words. He doesn't hold back. He's going to call people out as he feels he needs to. He's going to make sure what he needs to say gets said and, and off he goes. So, yeah, it's a it's definitely one of those things where I think as we look at um, uh, Tristan Thompson, it is. It can be hard to swallow if he's not producing. Uh, this year's a little weird because he he's been in and out of the rotation. He's not playing a lot, but you know, generally he's kind of played okay when he's there. And I think his main point was like, hey, it's the guys in the soccer room want to win. It's just figuring out how do we do that on a day to day basis. So yeah, I mean, good good for him for saying his piece, I guess, on a franchise that's uh, moving on what a decade and a half of not not making the the yeah, postseason. Absolutely, uh, Keith. Our two teams play tonight. The Lakers and Celtics yeah, are playing each other. You're going to join me over on the LakersNation.com postgame show. That's going to be a lot of fun. I was telling our listeners yeah. the other day uh, after the Lakers lost to the Bucks that uh, that you'd be on the show. And uh, and they were excited. They, they said, you know, we love Keith. We can't wait. Um, it's going to be a lot of fun. It'll be a first. It'll be the first. <laughs> love It'll me now. The, this will be, I told, <laughs> I told everybody, I said, I said, don't worry. I said, Keith's a good guy. We're not going to be like going after each other or anything like that. Hopefully it's all going to be just fine, but this will be the first time that we've had an opposing viewpoint on the post game show. So I think this is going to be a lot of fun. Um, Unfortunately, the one thing that could damper the fun is injuries. Um, Why don't we start with the Celtics? You got an update this morning on, uh, on some unfortunate news on Jalen Brown. Yeah. Yeah, we were hoping to get an injury update at shoot around, did not get that, which then led us to believe Barrow probably not gonna hear anything until we get to the um to to right before right. pregame, uh or in the pregame process. But now the Celtics really released an updated injury report. Jalen Brown is out tonight, uh continues to work his way back from a hamstring strain. They said it would be about two weeks. I believe tomorrow is two weeks exactly. So not entirely surprising. Quite frankly, this is probably the best um, thought process from the Celtics and Jalen Brown hamstrings. Yeah, you rush back from a hamstring injury. That can be then something that sets you way back down for a long time. Uh, Robert Williams questionable. He's got some knee soreness. We'll see what happens with him. But then Dennis Schroeder was the one that kind of came out of nowhere. He was added to the injury report just uh, a little bit, a little bit ago this afternoon on Friday afternoon with a left ankle sprain. It looked like he tweaked it at the end of the Hawks game on Wednesday, uh, but was not on the initial injury report. So my guess is he was feeling something as he went through shoot around today. And uh, we'll, we'll see if any of those three, three guys go that's uh two starters and a semi-starter with Schroeder because he's been starting uh while Jalen Brown that's, is out uh, perhaps disrupting the Dennis Schroeder re- revenge tour right where he's playing a number of yeah. teams that he's played yep. for in the past he's what yeah. it's the Hawks yeah. then the Lakers then OKC is that right then OKC yeah the Celtics have the OKC in a back-to-back oh, tomorrow okay on a Saturday night. So they, they yeah, had Schroeder three, three, uh, three former teams and three, uh, three games in a row in four days. Well, from the, the Lakers side of things, we know that Austin Reeves will be out for this one. However, um, I did get word that he uh, is supposed to be today participating in two on two. We've talked about ramping up and how players do that. Already played one on one. He's been playing. He's going to play two on two. He's been feeling good so far. Also dealing with a hamstring injury, but he'll be out tonight. Um, so that is a, you know, a tough one for the, for the Lakers. Kendrick Nunn, still no update there on him. Getting a little concerned with that situation that we haven't heard anything. And we're well past now the three week reevaluation date for him with that bone bruise. Uh, of course, Trevor Ariza is out and LeBron James is a game time decision. And here's the thing with Frank Vogel though. He may already know what LeBron is doing. Uh, he tends to like to not release his lineup until the moment he absolutely has to. So yep. even if they know for sure he is or is not playing, they were probably always going to list him as a game time decision, but he will be a game time decision for tonight, which is a big step forward because he's just been out 
for all the other games and until he was switched to questionable last night and now a game time decision for uh for tonight's contest yeah and that's it's kind of the the step mm -hmm. up right as you go is you know you come up to game time decision and we'll, we'll go from there and as i said before i mean you want the best players to play uh, especially when these two teams meet, it just you know me means a uh, a little bit more uh, usually. So a couple things I did um as I do before every Celtics game for Celtics blog, I do a uh, things I'm watching for uh, in that night's game. Sometimes they're Celtics related, sometimes they're game related. I started out with who plays, so we already covered that that part of the news. Uh, next thing is this kind of caught me off guard a little bit. I was not fully prepared that the Lakers play at the league's second fastest pace. Um, which doesn't fully surprise me with Russell Westbrook, um, uh, you know, kind of doing his coast to coast thing off the boards and, you know, the way he'll play sometimes. But watching them when I started really thinking about it more, I was like, well, you know, AD does a good amount of ripping and running and bringing them up himself. They've got a couple other guys who like to push the ball as well. Um, and they, they take a lot of shots very early in the shot clock, which – clearly has to happen to <laughs> to uh to go plus they also uh they're a high turnover team which generally tends to create more mm -hmm. possessions in a game as well uh boston on the flip side plays they they slog through games and early on in the year Ime Doka talked about i want this to be an up tempo team i want to play fast i want to get up and down the floor and those kind of things and then he um, I think with the injuries and the offense being very limited, I think he has uh, embraced this. Let's really defend. We'll play slower pace, lower position games and go. So I think that that may have have a big deal. Uh, the other thing that is uh, for both teams is, man, the Lakers follow a lot. Boy, they put they put teams at, at the line the uh, second most in mm -hmm. the NBA. Uh, on a per game basis and even when you adjust for pace i want to say they were 20th or 22nd um in that in the celtics as much as people bellyache about stuff a lot um at least on my side of things um they're 10th in the league in free throws so that could be something where boston could you know really try to um you know steal some offense there by getting to the line a little bit more often and especially if you can get downhill against some guys and and get yourself self to the line and then the last note was jason tatum had a big game against atlanta He's had a couple other big games where he shot well uh, this year, but followed right back with a bunch of stinkers in a row. In his past, when he finally does break out of a slump, it tends to be multiple games in a row, and he starts looking like one of the best players in the league. So let's see if he's out of the slump or if we're right back to where we've been all season long. But those those are kind of the things I'll have my eye on. And tonight. from the Lakers side of things, the foul is absolutely an issue. Frank Vogel talked about it after the game against the Bucks. He is not happy with the officiating at all. In fact, if you saw Frank Vogel against the Bucks, I don't know, I think I've ever seen him this angry before in a game. He didn't get tossed but he was about as angry as we've ever seen him to the point where he started turning shades of red, which if you know Frank Vogel at all, he's a very <laughs> even keeled guy. This is not normal for him. He was beside himself that Anthony Davis got no free throws against the Bucks. He called out the league, called out the officiating. Um, I don't, I can't say it's all the officiating, right? Um, no, it because isn't. it's not. Because like, they've got high foul players. Right, that's that's certainly Dude. part of it. And Frank yeah. Vogel as a coach is very much a don't foul coach. That's what he preaches, but his yeah. players don't really fit that. So we'll see what sure. that looks like if the Lakers are able to keep themselves out of foul trouble in this one or not. I'll also say the Lakers have been a very high take foul team to stop fast breaks. So yeah. that contributes to their foul total and adds it up quickly. Russell Westbrook, last I looked, was leading the NBA in take fouls. That that foul that we want to get rid of so badly. Um, speaking... <laughs> yeah, he loves he giving He really those. does. And uh, he also loves giving turnovers. That's going to be key uh, for the Lakers. Is cutting down on turnovers. I've gone over this stat quite a bit in terms of points per possession, what a turnover really means and all of that. It's really, really bad. I can say that. Um, Russell Westbrook did a much better job last game, though only three turnovers on the game, despite having two early ones, went through the whole rest of the game with only one turnover. So they made a few little tweaks in terms of what he was doing out on the floor, in terms of who he was passing to, the types of passes he was making, and it made a big difference, kept them in the game against the Bucs when otherwise they, they wouldn't have been. So we'll see what, what version of Russell Westbrook we get in this one. Anthony Davis has also come under fire for not really showing up against Giannis, on uh, their last performance, we'll see if he has a little bit of extra motivation in him. Obviously, LeBron playing or not is going to be a big deal. But aside from the turnovers, the other big problem for the Lakers on the season has been the offensive glass. Part of that has been without LeBron, you, they've been running Dwight Howard, 
and or Anthony Davis, and then a bunch of guards, right? A lot of times you're having AD yeah. surrounded by four guards. So if you're big, whether it's Dwight or AD or even DeAndre Jordan is boxed out on a play, the other the opponent has had a major size advantage in all the other positions. So what the Lakers can do to keep the Celtics off the offensive glass will be a big storyline as well in this one from the Lakers side of things. Yeah, and the Celtics, they, they without uh, Robert Williams the last couple games, have unearthed Dennis Cantor has gotten back into the, the lineup some. Um, so, yeah. yeah, yeah, at some point. Let's not do that no. today, though. But it, but it might um, be a factor the, tonight with his uh, – he had a tweet about LeBron. And... He did, yeah, yeah. If you're going to call out LeBron, you better be ready. Yeah. Um, that's all. I, we know he sees yeah. everything, even if he doesn't necessarily respond to it. Uh, but, yeah, so we'll see if Cantor plays, doesn't play, probably highly depend on if Robert Williams is uh, in the game or not. Uh, but Robert Williams himself has been an offensive rebounding machine this year. The Celtics as a team, they're middle of the pack. They they don't do you know a ton of getting to the glass, but Robert Williams can make your life miserable in there because he'll, he'll go after it, create second chance opportunities. I don't think, let me check, he is still leading the league at 73.4% uh, field goal percentage uh, for Robert Williams. So yeah, he's a uh, you know, it gets up there 4.1 offensive rebounds per night uh, for him. So we'll see if they can Kid, get to both the Both these teams have been disappointing this season. The Celtics at seven and eight, sitting yes. in ninth in the Eastern Conference. The Lakers at eight and eight, sitting in ninth in the Western Conference. Um, both fan bases has been have been very much on edge, right? Where with every loss, the sky is falling. Everything is horrible. Trade everyone, fire everyone. That That side of that sort of thing has started to come out of both fan bases. So I, the glass is half empty way to look at this is no matter what happens tonight, one fan base is going to be inconsolable. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Let's do a little bit of bummer breaking news here uh -oh. to end uh, the show. Uh, Woj just tweeted, uh, the NBA has suspended Pelicans for Didi Luzada for 25 games without pay for violating the NBA's anti-drug program. The NBA has also released it. Uh, tested positive for uh, testosterone and drosdanolone. I don't, I'm probably saying that wrong, and I don't know what that is, so I'm not going to speculate beyond that, but yeah, not uh, – not good news. I mean, he doesn't really play for the Pelicans anyway, but but never good news to see somebody getting a um, a drug uh, or performance enhancing drug or whatever it is uh, related Absolutely. suspension. Absolutely. That's uh, that's not good news. All right. Well, bummer that we have to end it on that. Actually, you know what, Keith? Let's end it on it. Let's end it on a high point. You and I get to talk Let's more basketball tonight. I think that's a, yeah. that's a positive thing, even if one of us will be a little bit sad. 100%. At the end, at the end of the yep. night, that's okay. We still get to talk more basketball tonight, so I think that's a good thing. Yeah, I think because we're so excited, this is probably just going to be some stupid uh, uh, blowout one way or the other, and it, it won't. It just won't be a fun game that comes down. No, to the end, but we're, we're fingers positive crossed. We right now, Keith, we have to end on a positive. Yeah, all right, positive, positive. <laughs> Let me reframe. This is going to be a fantastic game tonight. I can't wait. Uh, we're all fired up and ready to go. But yeah, no, absolutely. I'm, uh, you know, I'm excited. I'll be excited to join you later. And uh, one of the two of us will be uh, rocking the other team's uh, primary uh, color as best we can. Uh, we, we already talked that. That's our That's friendly right. little bet on this. Neither one of us owns. Uh, I don't own Lakers gear. Trevor doesn't own Celtics gear. But uh, mm -hmm. you've got some green. I've got some some uh, purple. So we'll we'll figure out how to how to work that into the mix uh, you know, on That's the post game right. show. That's right. We'll make it happen. All right, everybody, appreciate you joining us. Make sure you do subscribe to the NBA Front Office YouTube channel. Make sure you ring the notification bell as well and follow us wherever you listen to podcasts, whether it's Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever. Make sure you follow us and give us that rating and five-star review. We'd certainly appreciate it. Till next time, everybody, stay safe and see ya.